Hello out there. My name is Paul Copperman, uh, chair of the Holocaust Memorial Committee, which uh, year after year brings together the program for Holocaust Memorial Week. And I welcome all of you in attendance. Uh, and we hope that you can attend um, other events during the week as well. But in the meantime, it is just um, extraordinary that we can be starting off Holocaust Memorial Week number 34. This goes back to 1987, this series at Oregon State University, uh, that we can welcome you all to it. And I welcome you, I should mention, uh, through the providence of our various sponsors and benefactors, uh, including um, Adam, including the city of Corvallis, uh, the OSU Provost's Fund for Excellence, the Center for the Humanities, as well as many, many individual donors. Uh, we thank them all. I would also like to personally thank uh, Aaron Sneller and Natalia Bueno, who have been who have been so helpful in so many ways, uh, lending us their uh, technical expertise in a circumstance where um, we, or certainly I, need all the help that we can get. So. Uh, it is fitting that uh, we're able to start Holocaust Memorial Week with a survivor speaker, uh, a renowned speaker sharing her experiences with us uh, and to introduce you to her. I'm going to turn this over to one of my colleagues on the Holocaust Memorial Committee, Benita Blessing. Um, welcome everybody to the first night of our Holocaust Memorial Week in our uh, new Zoom format. As you know, we had to delay last year because of the pandemic and we're so very, very grateful to Marianne blumenthal on to be with us uh, this evening and to all of you um, for also coming out and making time in this format. Um, I'm an instructor in world languages and uh, cultures, and I teach German, and a uh, little hi to all of my students out there. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I would like to point out that um, I'll just give one brief introduction here, and then after Marion talks, she said that she'll be taking and asking some questions during her talk. You'll be able to do that in the Q&A. When you post questions, you will not be able to see them. I will see them, and um, I'll kind of collect them as they go along um, and we'll have time for Q&A afterwards as well. So you can post questions and then I'll collect them and then we'll read them for her to respond to at the end. Um, the, um, and the other point, uh, I'll, I'll talk about her book in one second. Um, if you are interested in purchasing her book in like a book plate with your name on it um, from her um, signed, then she's happy to provide those as well. You can send her an email. You can also just email any of us here at the Holocaust Memorial Week and we'll help put you in touch with her that way as well. Marianne Blumenthal Lazan was a child when her family found themselves trapped in Nazi Germany. And the um, very um, compelling and exciting story that she tells in the book, uh, Four Perfect Pebbles, is one that she often has described as being one that Anne Frank could have told had she lived. Um, this is an important perspective for us as historians of, and scholars of the Holocaust um, and looking at what the um, process of surviving looks like, what happens afterwards as well, and what do those memories uh, look like? How do they function later in life? One of the things I most like about perf uh, Four Perfect Pebbles is its intended audience. It's a book that anyone can read. It's especially a fantastic book for children and young people. I think as a Holocaust historian, I'm all often asked, what, what can I have my kids read? 
but can I have the children in my classroom read or my teenagers? And this is a book I really recommend to you for that purpose. Um, a couple of years ago, it came into a 20th anniversary edition with extra pieces in it, including a lovely afterward. So um, definitely recommend that you take a look at that. Um, you might also consider looking at the documentary that sometimes is screened on PBS, um, Marion's Triumph an excellent documentary about an hour long that also really is um, an important addition, I think, with some visual uh, representations here as well of that story. Uh, you can find a copy of that DVD um, online pretty easily. Um, Marian's book has been translated into Dutch, German, Hebrew, and Japanese. She is internationally renowned as a speaker and has done work uh, for decades with her husband, who she told me earlier she couldn't do it without um, helping educate audiences about the Holocaust. Marian, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, and so please take it away. Thank you so much, Professor Benita Blessing for your very meaningful and kind introduction. Thank you, Professor Paul Kopperman and the Oregon State University Holocaust Committee for giving me the opportunity to participate in this year's Shoah commemoration. I so wish that I could be with all of you in person, but since we still have this COVID in our midst, we will use this amazing Zoom technology to connect with one another. And thank you, Erin Sneller, for being the tech lady for the evening. Thank you. I am with you to share my story. It is my childhood experiences during World War II in the concentration camps. I will tell you about our liberation and how we finally started our lives anew in our blessed United States of America. Yes, mine is a story that Anne Frank might have told had she survived. This is also a story that conveys a message of perseverance, determination, faith, and above all hope. After the presentation, I will be pleased to answer some of your questions. Life in the early 1930s in Germany was very much for my family as it is here for most of you today. Never did we think that the anti-Semitic incidents there would ever lead to very much. My father was in a successful shoe business in a small town. My parents, two year older brother and I, lived comfortably with my grandparents above the shoe store. Life for Jews was made increasingly more difficult. And in 1935, the Nuremberg laws were formulated and enforced. The following are just some of the many restrictions imposed on the Jews in Germany. Jews were not allowed into theaters, into parks, or into swimming pools. All public schools were close to Jewish children. Then there was an evening curfew for the Jews. Jews were only allowed to shop during specific hours of the day, and non-Jews were not allowed to shop in Jewish-owned stores. Non-Jews were just not allowed to associate with Jewish people. And then a big letter J for Jew was stamped on ID cards and on passports. These restrictions went on and on. And it was then that my parents decided to make arrangements to leave the country. My grandparents who were in the late seventies and ill refused to leave their home. They could not understand the urgency or the necessity of doing so. My grandparents passed away in 1938, just 11 days within each other. And soon thereafter, we received our necessary papers for our emigration to America. I was just four years old at that time. November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht or Crystal Night. It was the night of broken glass when the Nazis and their many followers smashed the windows and the storefronts of Jewish owned stores, Jewish establishments, synagogues, and Jewish books were burned and destroyed. This was the beginning of a massive pogrom against the Jews in Germany, a massive verbal and physical assault against all German Jews. In reality, this was the beginning of the Holocaust. 
On November 12th, following Kristallnacht, the German government actually fined the Jewish population for the damage caused that night. These imposed taxes were used to rearm Germany. The night of Kristallnacht, our apartment was ransacked. All valuables were thrown into a pillowcase and taken away. But worst of all was that they transported my father to concentration camp Buchenwald in Germany. All sorts of terrible stories were related to my mother and we did not know if we would ever see my father again. He was released after three weeks only because our papers were in order for our emigration to America. And to think that just a few years prior, he had been awarded the Iron Cross for his military service in the German army of World War I. We were forced to sell both our home and our business for a fraction of its worth. And soon thereafter, in January of 1939, we left for Holland from where we were to sail to the United States. And for almost nine months, while awaiting our quota number from the American State Department, my parents were assigned to take care of some 125 children. These young children had been sent by their parents from various parts of Europe to escape from the Nazis. In December of that year, 1939, we were deported to the detention camp of Westerwalk in Holland to await our departure day to America. Camp Westerwalk was constructed by the Dutch to accommodate Jews from various parts of Europe. In May of 1940, just one month before our planned departure day, the Germans invaded Holland and we were trapped. All of our belongings, which were about to be loaded on board ship, were burned and destroyed as the harbor of Rotterdam was bombed. Under Dutch control, Camp Westerbrook were tolerable. My mother, father, brother, and I shared two small rooms. We all ate in a communal dining room. And at that time, there was enough food for us so that we did not go hungry. Adults were assigned to various work duties. My father worked to repair shoes. My mother worked in the kitchen. We children had a makeshift education and lived a very dull, stagnant life. Several months later, when the Nazi SS took over the command of Westerwald, we became acquainted with the ever-present, terrifying 12-foot-high barbed wire and as thousands of Jews were rounded up, many taken from their hiding places, as was Anne Frank and her family, Camp Westerbrook became overcrowded. And it was at that time that we had to share our small quarters with another family. And then the dreadful transports to the concentration and extermination camps in Eastern Europe began. This started in early 1942. And from then on, every Monday night, lists of those to be deported were posted, causing incredible anxiety, anguish, and fear. And then on Tuesday mornings, men, women, and little ones were marched to a nearby railroad platform from where they were transported. This area became known as Boulevard de Misere. It was an area of complete misery. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, the trains left for their destination. And of the total 120,000 men, women, and children that departed Westerbork, 102,000 were doomed never to return. In January of 1944, it was our turn to be shipped out. We children were actually glad for a change of environment. We were very naive and we welcomed the move. We were allowed to take one knapsack each and whatever we could stuff into it, we were permitted to take. When we approached the railroad platform and we saw the cattle cars in which we were to travel, our fears began to mount. Adults suspected, and they somehow knew what was in store for us. I remember that it was a bitter cold, pitch black, rainy night when we arrived at our destination, concentration camp Bergen-Belsen in Germany. 
we were pulled and dragged out of the cattle cars and greeted by the German guards who were shouting at us and threatening us with their weapons and with the most vicious attack dogs by their sides. I was a very frightened nine-year-old. And to this day, I still feel a certain sense of fear whenever I see a German shepherd. Bergen-Belsen was divided into various areas. It was sectioned off and surrounded by electrified barbed wire. Guards were always in strategically placed high guard towers. And in the evenings, as soon as it would turn dark, the dry, bright searchlights from above would constantly sweep the campgrounds. We were placed in a section that was known as the Sternlager or the star camp, named so because we had to continue wearing that yellow star, which had been issued to us back in Holland. Men were on one side of the camp and the women on the other. And this did make it possible at times for families to get a glimpse of one another. We were placed in this particular section of the camp with the hope of being exchanged for German nationals in Palestine, who the British put under house arrest because they were citizens of an enemy country. Unfortunately, this hope never materialized for our family. 600 of us, 600 of our people were crammed into each of the crude, wooden, heatless barracks, meant for 100 when originally built. There were triple-decker bunk beds with two people sharing each bunk. German winters were bitter cold and very long. We were given only one thin blanket per bunk and a straw-filled mattress. And this bunk was our only living quarters and that for two people. I was very lucky that I was able to share a bunk with my mother and that my brother was able to share a bunk with our father. But can you imagine two adults, two strangers, sharing a bunk under such horrendous conditions, a bunk that was no larger than the small cot bed that we're all so familiar with. I remember the first time seeing a wagon filled with what I thought was firewood for the one small oven that we had in our barracks. That oven, of course, was never used. I soon realized that what was in the wagon were dead, naked bodies thrown one on top of the other. Toilets and so-called washing facilities were at a great distance in the most primitive outhouses. Toilets were long wooden benches with holes cut into them, one next to the other. There was no privacy, there was no toilet paper, there was no soap and hardly ever any water with which to wash. And in the almost year and a half that we were in Bergen-Belsen, never once were we able to brush our teeth. There were no trees, no flowers, nor did we ever see a blade of grass. And whenever it rained, we had to slush through the mud, adding even more misery to our very dismal existence. Every morning, every single morning, without fail, we were ordered to line up on a huge field. It was called an Appellplatz, five in a row as we were counted. We would have to stand there until each and every one of us was accounted for, often from early morning till late at night, without food, without water, no matter what the weather without protective clothing. Frostbite was common. We would treat our affected toes and fingers with the warmth of our own urine. Our diet consisted of a slice of bread a day, some hot watery soup with grizzly meats and turnips and potato peel. The bread was later cut back and given to us just once a week and only if our so-called quarters were neat and in order. Our birthday present for one another was that little piece of bread that we had saved up from the previous week. Once a month, we were marched to an area to shower. And there, under the watchful eyes of the guards, we were ordered to undress. We had heard about exterminations and gas chambers in other areas of Europe. And we therefore were never sure when the faucets were turned on 
as to what would come out, water or gas. The Nazis did their utmost to break us physically, spiritually and emotionally. Unfortunately, they did succeed with many of our people. It was not uncommon for people who were no longer responsible for their actions to attempt escape, even though they knew that the chance to succeed was next to impossible. But they also felt that they had nothing more to lose. The failure of their attempts were obvious when we saw their lifeless bodies hanging electrocuted against the barbed wire. Malnutrition, dysentery, and the loss of the will to go on is what destroyed body and mind. Death was an everyday occurrence. The dark crowded quarters often caused us to trip and fall over the dead. Bodies could not be taken away fast enough. We as children saw things that no one, no matter what the age, should ever have to see. I know, of course, that you've all read, you've uh, seen movies, perhaps even true documentaries about the Holocaust, but the constant foul odor, the filth, continuous horror and fear surrounded by death is indescribable. There is no way that this can be put accurately into words or pictures. Our bodies, hair and clothes were infested with lice. We learned that there was a distinct difference between head lice and clothes lice. Squashing them between my thumbnails became my primary pastime. Much of my time was taken up with make-believe games and one game, a game based on superstition became very important to me. I decided that if I were to find four pebbles of about the same size and shape, that that would mean that the four members of my family would all survive. My mother, my father, my brother, and I. It was a torturous, painful, very difficult game to play. What if I couldn't find that third or fourth pebble? Might that mean that one or two of my family members would not survive? Nevertheless, this game gave me something to hold on to, some distant hope. After a number of months on our meager diets, our stomach shrunk so that the hunger was no longer painful. Teenagers and men suffered most from malnutrition and were the first to die. Those who lasted the longest were the women and mothers in particular. It was their strong will to keep their children alive that kept them going. And my mother was one of those remarkable ladies. There is no doubt in my mind that it was my mother's inner strength and fortitude that finally saw us through. One day, my mother was able to smuggle some potatoes and some salt from the kitchen where she worked. And somehow, somehow managed to cook some soup in secret. This was done on our bunk. I was on the bunk with her, trying to hide and shield what she was doing. Super simmering, just about finished, when the German guards entered our barrack for surprise inspection. In our rush to hide that setup, the boiling soup spilled on my leg. We had been taught self-discipline and self-control the hard way, for I knew had I cried out, it would have cost us our lives. This happened in the spring of 1945, I was just 10 years old. The population in Kempag and Belsen were dying off rapidly, but not nearly fast enough to satisfy the Nazis. Several weeks later, it was decided to send three trainloads of our people to Eastern Europe towards the extermination camps and the gas chambers. We did not know that Auschwitz with its gas chambers had already been liberated. My family was among the 2,500 on the last of these three trains. It was April of 1945, Russian army was closing in from the Northeast and the British and the Americans from the West. Under normal conditions, this train ride from Wagen Velsen to whatever area of Eastern Europe they're going to send us would have taken no more than 10 hours. But because the Germans tried to evade the, evade the Allies, we were on route for two long weeks without food, without water, without medical supplies, without sanitary facilities, that meant no toilets. Whenever the train came to a stop, those who were able and those who were strong enough were permitted to get out and take a drink from a nearby stream or dig up woods to eat. 
my mother remembered taking some sort of a pot and collecting water from the locomotive and who knows what else that pot was used for. The need for water at that time was almost more important than food because of the severe dehydration due to the dysentery and the high fever due to the typhus. Let me briefly explain typhus. It is a highly contagious, deadly disease that's caused from filth and spread by lice. At the same time, while the train was at a standstill, the newly dead were taken off and buried along the tracks. In addition, our train was subject to frequent air attacks by the Allies. It is truly remarkable how any one of us was able to survive under such horrendous conditions. In fact, 500 of our people, that's one out of every five, died on wood or shortly thereafter. My burnt leg was severely infected and it was impossible to keep the wound clean or lice free. In late April, after 14 days of this surreal and horrifying journey, the German guards stormed frantically through the train seeking civilian clothing so that they would not be recognized by the Allies. And we knew then that the war was coming to an end. It was the Russian army that liberated our train and led us to a nearby farm village in Eastern Germany. Most of the inhabitants had fled and we took over the homes. Kitchens were stocked with ample food. It was rich and good, actually much too good for our starved bodies. We could not tolerate that unfamiliar nourishment. And at that time, at the age of 10 and a half, I weighed 16 kilos, or as we know it here, 35 pounds, and my mother weighed a mere 70 pounds. The Russians, in a crude way, tried to help us the best that they could. I was brought to a nearby clinic for medical attention. My leg was in very bad condition, and I was close to losing it. Fortunately, it was decided to treat the wound, and I was very lucky that my leg responded to medication, and it gradually healed. As I regained my strength, I also relearned to walk. And in the interim, our heads were shaved because that was the only way that, would, that we could rid ourselves of head lice. Although we were all weak, ill, and thoroughly exhausted, I vividly remember the spring of 1945. Weather was beautiful, sunny and bright. Trees and grass were lush and green. Flowers were in bloom, birds were singing. It was a wonderful, wonderful, exciting feeling to be free at long last. We were all ill with typhus, but my father had to die from it six weeks after our liberation. And this after six and a half years of mental torment and physical abuse. My 12 year old brother Albert actually helped bury our father. When I talk about those years, it is as though I'm relating a nightmare, a very bad dream. I separate myself from it ever having happened to me, and that is how I deal with it. It is a wonderful story of how we gradually recuperated and were sent back to Holland to start our lives anew. My brother and I were eventually placed in the children's home in preparation to live in what was then British mandated Palestine, and we know today as Israel. Most of the children in this home survived alone without their parents. I felt like a total misfit. I needed to learn how to resettle into a normal society, had no training for that. Here I was by this time, 11 years old, had never been in a store, had no idea what money was all about, had almost no table manners. It was like learning to live all over again. It was in this home that we became, that became acquainted with life in its normal state. The meals served us were delicious and nourishing. And you can imagine that just about anything and everything tasted good to us. And though our surrogate parents provided a very strict environment, much love and care were given us. I began my first formal education at that time at the age of 11 and a half. We were taught the secular subjects, reading, writing, arithmetic in a Montessori school where we progressed at our own pace. The Dutch language in which we were taught was all new to us. 
also received a thorough education in Hebrew and in religious studies. The British, who were governing Palestine in the 1940s, had issued what was known as the White Papers, restricting the number of Jews permitted into the land. They were intercepting many of the refugee ships and interning the survivors on the island of Cyprus, and in some cases, turning the ships back to Europe. In November of 1947, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine between Arabs and Jews, which on May 14, 1948, led to the establishment of the State of Israel. In 1947, just one year prior to Israel becoming a state, our illegal voyage from Harlem to Palestine was planned and danger once again loomed over us. And because parents at that time were not permitted to accompany their children, my mother managed to make arrangements for a family of three to emigrate to the United States. And thanks to the Holland America line, we were able to use the tickets which had been purchased 10 years earlier. We arrived in Hoboken, New Jersey, April 23rd, 1948, by coincidence, exactly three years to the day of our liberation. It was a Jewish relief organization, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, that found a home for us in Peoria, Illinois. Never heard of Illinois, definitely not Peoria. And there, at the age of 13, I once again started life anew in a strange land and again learning a new language, my third new language in less than three years. First Dutch, then Hebrew, and now English. And because of my inability to speak English, I, at the age of 13, was placed in the fourth grade with nine-year-olds although both my brother and I worked long hours after school to help our mom pay bills, I nevertheless found time, actually made time to take extra courses during the year, attend summer school, and by working very hard in my studies, I was able to be graduated from Peoria Central High School five years later at age 18, ranking eighth in a class of 267 students. It was two months after high school graduation that I was married to Nathaniel Lazan, who I had met at the age of 16 in Peoria. And we are so grateful to have celebrated our 67th wedding anniversary this past August. Nathaniel, come say hello to these nice people. This is Hi, everybody. He's amazing, amazing with technology. He was an Air Force pilot, so very... Um, very strict and very, um, in, in all respect, outstanding. I am grateful. I am very grateful that I survived healthy in body, mind, and spirit, and that together with my husband, I'm able to perpetuate my heritage with a wonderful family. We have three grown children, all three are happily married, and they've given us nine beautiful grandchildren and seven amazing great-grandchildren. Amazing, amazing is right. And in March of 1996, my memoir, Four Perfect Pebbles, co-authored by Lila Pearl, was published by Green Willow Division of HarperCollins. It is now in its 34th printing and hardback. And HarperCollins decided to do a 20th anniversary edition. This is it. I don't know if you can see this. And I was not happy with that cover. It, I'm sure it's that Bob Wire that bothered me, but they were in charge and that was it. And as you heard earlier from Professor Blessings, we, it's been translated into German, into Dutch. Uh, Hebrew Yad Vashem in Jerusalem did a super job on theirs. Can you see that? They did a really beautiful job. And yes, if you like, you may all read it in Japanese. But above all, I am so grateful that the story is in book form so that it can be passed on to future generations. And I'm thrilled that a documentary has been made entitled Marion's Triumph with the actress Deborah Messing as the narrator. It's been aired over PBS stations throughout the country the past several years or so. So you see that despite all the terrible things that happened to me as a child, my life today 
is full and rewarding. Although I've spoken to upward of one and a half million students and adults over these past 20 some years, it still has not become easy. However, I do realize the importance of sharing that period of our history with you, simply because in a few short years, we will not be here any longer to give a first hand account. You, the students, it is your generation that is the very last generation that will hear these stories firsthand. And I therefore ask you to please, please share my story or any of the Holocaust stories that you read and hear about. Share them with your friends, share them with your relatives, and someday, someday share them with your children. And yes, even with your grandchildren. When we are not here any longer, it is you who will have to to bear witness. As difficult as it is, the horror of the Holocaust of the Shoah must be taught, must be studied and kept alive. Only then can we guard it from ever happening again. This, this is the very yellow star that I was forced to wear. It says Jude, which in German means Jew. It was just another way to denigrate us, to isolate us, and to set us apart from the rest of society. This, of course, represents the Star of David, a beautiful, meaningful Jewish symbol. But the Nazis made it so very ugly. Each of us, each and every one of us, must do everything in our power to prevent such hatred, such destruction, and such terror from reoccurring. And we can begin by having love, respect, and tolerance, and compassion towards one another, regardless of the religious belief, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of the national origin. This respect towards one another must begin in our homes around the kitchen table, dining room table, wherever we gather as a family. We, the adults, must pass it on our places of business. You, the students, in your classrooms, in the halls of your universities, in the communities, in the towns, in the cities, and only if there's respect and tolerance and compassion towards one another in the countries can we expect to have peace in the world. We must begin with you, the students. We must begin with our children. Let us treat people as individuals. Let us look for similarities and respect the differences. Let us build bridges and reach out towards one another. And we must be true to ourselves and not blindly follow a leader without thinking ahead and searching our hearts and our minds as to what the consequences might be. It is not cool to follow just anyone's lead without first checking to see what his or her true intentions are. Please, please remember these messages. Share them with your friends who are unable to be with us this evening. Share them, remember them, but above all, let us all live by them. We're all aware, or we should be, that six million Jewish people were murdered during the Holocaust of the Second World War. Your beautiful state of Oregon has a population of a little over four million. Can you possibly imagine the entire population of Oregon wiped out plus another two million? The six million also represent one third of the entire pre-World War II Jewish population. Among them were one and a half million children. We also need to know and remember that there were five million non-Jews who lost their lives. Among them were the righteous Gentiles as we refer to them, 
very special people, non-Jews who jeopardized their lives to save Jewish families. They would hide them in the attics. They would hide them in the basements. Farmers would hide them out in the barns. They were hidden in convents. And when these good people were caught doing what they felt was the right thing to do, they also were deported to concentration camps and in many cases lost their lives. And that brings me to another message. We must never generalize and judge an entire group by the action of some within that group. These are all universal messages, messages that each and every one of us is familiar with to varying degrees, but need to be reminded of over and over again. And this certainly was a good opportunity to do so. These messages are the lessons learned from that dark period of our history and certainly apply to today's world situations and definitely to our own individual lives. By listening, I hope that you prevent our past from becoming your future. I now need to share something with you by the very special lady, my mother. This was my mother on her 104th birthday a magnificent, wise, beautiful lady. Mom passed away six weeks short of 105th birthday. Remarkable, she went through two world wars. There were two things that my mother demanded of my brother and me when we came to America. Number one, learn English, learn it quickly. Number two, work as hard as you can in school and at work in order to succeed. You need to know that my mom was 40 years old when she came to America, 40, knew no English whatsoever, learned to read, write, and speak a magnificent English. An amazing, wise, outstanding lady. My brother passed away about three years ago dealt with this altogether differently than I did. He did not talk about it as freely as you heard it from me this evening. Was happily married, lived in California, but by choice did not bring children into this world. Had a very difficult time with organized religion. All of that made me very sad. But I didn't fall down, but we have to remember, he was two years older than I am, was with my father in the men's section, and I'm convinced that he saw and experienced things that I did not. God puts us on this earth, gives us a beautiful mind. It is this mind that allows us to choose right from wrong, good from evil. Therefore, men did this towards one another. But did he have to make it so bitterly cold when we were standing out there on the pell all day? I have a direct line. I ask loads of questions. Don't get too many answers, but that's okay. Faith I will always have. To. After all, here I am. Three children, nine grandchildren, seven great-grandchildren from whom generations will be forthcoming. He made sure that enough of us survived so that we will always be here. I am proud of my faith, as I'm certain you are proud of your faith and of your heritage. But please, please let us all remember to respect the right of others to their belief. Be kind and good and respectful and compassionate towards one another. That is the basis for peace. Had there been respect and tolerance towards one another some 70, 80 years ago, I would not be with you this evening to share that dark period of our history. 9-11 would not have occurred. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, North Korea, all these countries that are in such turmoil would be peaceful countries for its people. Be kind and good and respectful towards one another, please. It is such a simple message and yet so difficult to achieve. There is very little that we can do against the negativity in our world, but how we treat, behave, and reach out towards one another, that is entirely up to us. Did I ever find my four pebbles? Frequently asked question. 
I always found my four pebbles. I made it my business to find them. I cheated all the time. When I found them, I put them in a safe place. So the next time when I would search for them, I couldn't find the third one in the, or that fourth one. Well, I knew exactly where to go and pick them up. Maybe there was cheating, but it was my game. And guess who made the rules? You need to know that I was only about nine or 10 years old when things were at its absolute worst. We had nothing, nothing to occupy our time with constructively. No paper, no pencils, no books, certainly no games. So I was lucky at such an imaginative mind. My imaginative games were always based on a positive attitude. I would search for a piece of glass, a piece of a mirror, whatever I could find on the dirt ground in Bergen and Belgium. And when the sun would shine, and that didn't happen nearly often enough in that part of Germany, known for bad weather and cloudy skies, but I, Mary, knew that that sun would always come out. And when it did, that little piece of glass would cast a reflection onto the ground, and that little wiggly reflection, it became my pet. As long as the sun would shine, I would have my pet. My pet would never, ever die. I would also imagine that one day I once again would have my three Bs. And these three Bs represent our everyday comforts and necessities that we all take so much for granted. First B represented a bed. I knew that someday I once again would have my very own bed with a real mattress, clean sheets, and enough blankets to keep me warm. Second B represented a bath warm water, soap, clean towels, and with that would come toothpaste and a toothbrush, of course. And the third B was bread. I knew that someday I once again would have enough bread so that I would never again go hungry. These imaginary games, if you will, they were my survival techniques. They were my survival skills. Do you know that we all have survival techniques and skills within us? When the need arises, we just have to search for them, find them, and be sure that we put them to work. No one is spared adversity. No one is spared hardship. We all have to overcome obstacles at one time or another. But with perseverance, with determination, with faith, and above all hope, one can overcome just about anything and everything. Above all, never, ever give up. It is not so much what happens to a person, it is how we deal with the situation that makes the difference. Nathaniel is from New York. He went to Bradley University in Peoria, lucky me. He went home on vacation and way back then in the 1950s, long distance telephone calls were very expensive. There were no computers, there were no emails and no whatever you used texting. today, texting. But for a three cent stamp, and there really was such a thing as a three cent stamp, we would write to one another every single day. Major, major problems. In his letters to me, he would add five words that he asked me to define and put into a sentence. That's a lot of nerve with all I had to do. But I knew he meant to help me with my English, and I guess it did work. So thank you, Nathaniel. It was my pleasure, Marion. And I, on the other hand, would write my letters in rough draft with a dictionary by my side. And only when I was satisfied with the way the letter was written would I dare mail it to him. Talking about a dictionary. My father always carried a little chunky German English dictionary with him. He would study the vocabulary in secret whenever possible, always with the hope that someday he would reach America. When we came to the United States and approached New York Harbor, we were told the night before that if he wanted to see the Statue of Liberty, we needed to be on deck bright and early the next morning. Well, you can be sure that each and every one of us was on deck to greet and be greeted by that magnificent symbol of freedom, the freedom that had been denied us for so many years. And when that tall figure of that longed for symbol appeared, I became too choked up to talk. So many emotions seized me at once, joy and gratitude bitterness for the cruelty we and so many others had suffered and deep, deep sadness that Papa, my father, could not share this moment with us. He would never know that we had reached America at last. And to this day, when we crossed the Verrazano Bridge, 
Okay, the Bevis Island Bridge is a long bridge in New York that connects the borough of Staten Island with that of Brooklyn. And when we reach a certain point on that bridge, I will always crane my neck to see the Statue of Liberty. It's the most beautiful, meaningful, magnificent sight. We return to Germany on various occasions, at least eight times or so. And the first time we returned was back in 1995. It was the 50th anniversary of our liberation. And we visited my father's grave. And the reason my father and about 60 others have a private resting place in that farm village where we were liberated was because they died after some of the chaos had subsided. Those who died early on were all buried in mass graves. We also went to Bergen-Belsen. And Bergen-Belsen looks nothing the way I remembered it had been burned down under the direction of President Eisenhower, who was then the commander of the Allied forces, because the conditions of, of the camp would have created tremendous health hazards for that entire region of Germany. So other than the newly built documentation centers and exhibition centers, Bergen Belton looks like a park, green grass, shrubs, trees, really not bad looking at all, except for the mounds everywhere mounds with plagues that read, here lie a thousand, here lie 2,500. These are the mass graves of our people. We also went to our former hometown of Hoya near Hanover. And there we were greeted by public officials who apologized over and over again. And then there was a young non-Jewish couple born after the war and they took us to the Jewish cemetery, which was in terrible disarray, had not been cared for since 1938, took us to our family plot, and there among the toppled over stones was a brand new shiny granite footstone with the inscription, Zur Erinnerung an die zerstörte Grabstelle der Familie Blumenthal, Hoya 1894 bis 1938 in memory of the desecrated plot of the Blumenthal family, Hoya 1894 to 1938, placed there by this non-Jewish young couple, unbeknownst to us, a most beautiful, generous, kind gesture. Never thought that I would refer to non-Jewish Germans in such glowing terms. And it's people like these that renew one's faith in humanity. And they become wonderful, wonderful, dear, dear friends of ours. And each time we return, I speak in schools, universities, sometimes in churches, and um, tremendously well received, but also difficult for today's young people to hear. After all, their grandparents and great grandparents' generation were responsible for such terror. Then we returned in 2010 because a brand new public high school in my former hometown was named in my honor. So now we have the Marion Blumenthal Oberschule of Hoya, a tremendous celebration and very courageous for this little town to redress what happened so many years ago in their midst. And the night before the, gen uh, the commemoration, the night before the um, celebration of naming the school, we commemorated the night of broken glass on the site where our synagogue once stood. Difficult trips, yes, but no regrets having returned. Um, Germany is doing an outstanding job in continually reminding their people as to what has happened. It is mandatory for the subject to be taught in their schools. And they have various ways of reminding their people. We had the opportunity to see the parliament in Berlin. There were murals walls and walls of mural depicting the night of broken glass. And uh, they had the Stolperstein. Uh, Ms. Blessing, I don't know if you're, uh, Professor Blessing, if you're familiar with those. It's a Stolperstein, is it stumbling block? You don't really stumble over. It is a, a metal plaque deeply embedded in the sidewalk in front of the home where a person once lived and never returned with the name, date, of birth, they so he died, and where, how, and he, he or she died. I mean, it's enormous history on that little plaque, and uh, you can't help but see it. So it's various ways of 
uh, the population in Germany reminding its people. And that has to be commended for sure. Okay, I can open this up before I wind down. We'll open it up to questions, please. Um, great. Um, thank you so very much. I have several questions in the chat that I can I'll ask you. And I um, just for the audience, uh, a couple of those that are overlapping, I'll um, just kind of combine them together. Um, we have a uh, first of all, somebody uh, offered their congratulations to your to your uh, anniversary anniversary. They themselves are getting married soon and hope to use you as role models for um, for a happy marriage. That's really lovely that story there as well. Um, can you one of our audience members would like to know about how your faith has um, continued to give you hope and faith when you think about the past and looking towards the future as well. I. Uh... I certainly, as you heard me say, I, I definitely have faith. I question plenty. I have pl plenty, but that's okay. I'm entitled. And, uh, but faith, I will always have. And, and I, I'd like to think, of course, we have a man upstairs that, that uh, looks over after us and makes sure that eventually things will get better. Even with this COVID, it will get better. And he must have been crying also when he saw what his children were doing towards one another. So faith, as you heard me say, I certainly have. I do questions. I have plenty questions. And uh, um, but somehow it's that faith that kept me going. And my mother too. Not that we are observant, very observant, but. Um, um, I, I, I would say that faith kept, kept us going all mm -hmm. and still does. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, do you have one of our audience members would like to know if there's a happy memory that have that you held on? You mentioned a little bit about the, the shadow friends and things like that. Are there other memories that you kind of hold on to as this was an important piece? Um, anything else that I hold on to? Well, I, I have one very dear friend uh, in the, I have many dear friends throughout the six and a, six and a half years that we're in, incarcerated in various camps. And of course, Bergen Belsen was the absolute worst of them all. Mm -hmm. And many dear friends, many of them, of course, did not survive and have one dear, dear friend, Susie, who lives in Jerusalem. And we are connected with one another. We're very close friends. Not that we commiserate as to what happened back then, but we have uh, a special bond and a special connection with one another. And this, yes, Nathaniel. You'll be calling on April 23rd. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. April 23rd is when we were liberated. And we speak all the time, but April 23rd is a special connection for sure. That's our, the day that, uh, the day that we were liberated, yeah. Um, so several people thanking you for the important message of asking people to be tolerant and respectful of each other. Thank you very much for um, that. Um, a couple of questions about your mother. Um, you talk so much about what an important person she was and how strong she was. And um, uh, you know, how, how did she, you mentioned that she learned a language um, and, you know, as an adult, and how did she support you all? What kind of jobs did she have? She tremendously, tremendously disciplined. And she was a very bright lady, but when we came to America, we didn't know the language. So she was a housekeeper for a well-to-do family, a Jewish family. And that was lucky for us because she was, she bought leftover food home. I had hand-me-down clothes, which saved us a lot of money. And uh, by saving money and pooling all of our earnings, menial earnings, but whatever we pulled and we were able to get out of that hole in the wall that we lived in with two other families. They meant well, they had a place for us to stay, yes. But there was one kitchen for three families with a wooden ice box <laughs> and a wooden ice box. And the ice man came three times a week to put a block of ice in that box and which took up a lot of room. Three families, now it's, so it was very important that we were gonna get out of that place. And, and we did. And um, so, and my mother eventually, she, uh, she learned English, of course, as I mentioned, and she was a wonderful seamstress and she worked in a very um, 
uh, high, fashion. high high fashion men's clothing store, mm -hmm. and she uh, and by the way, should I tell you that Mamba's marriage did not? <laughs> okay. Anyway, my, my mother, I mean, she, she was married three more times after my father. Okay, she was very young. She was 37 when she passed away. And there she was left with sick children. She herself had typhus. No money, no home, no country. And uh, only 37 years old, so, and she was a lovely looking lady. So she, she was married a couple of times, two of them didn't work out, so they went out finished. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one wonderful person who had a wonderful uh, marriage, um, he passed away. My mother's favorite saying is the serenity prayer. God give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the wisdom to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Oh, the, I, the wisdom to know the difference, uh, something like that. So it, it's uh, she she lived by that, and she she made her own decisions, and she was just just a remarkable lady. Okay, next question. Um, thank you very much. I think there's a lot of interest in your mother among the audience. Oh, um, she was outstanding. Yes. She was a, what, she was a wonderful mother-in-law to Nathaniel. Oh, he, never he, a single argument. Oh, well, <laughs> and Nathaniel was the best son-in-law ever. Well, yes, it, it sounds like it was a, it, that was a good match that way as well. For sure. Um, so you're, um, you talked a little bit about Germans um, having uh, investigated their own past and their own role in the Holocaust and some of the important ways that Germans are doing that, including these little stumbling um, block plaques that we see. Uh, do you think that um, younger Germans as well, somebody's, you know, millennial Germans, are, are they open, do you think, to looking at their grandparents and great grandparents' role in German history as well? Are you seeing some of that? They have a very, very difficult time. I remember speaking at a middle school in Germany, just going back a number of years. And um, there was one, one young lady, she burst out crying. And um, well, she asked her grandparents. She, she, she had asked her grandparents what they, were doing. what they what they thought of the second world war why where were they what did they do during that time and they would not answer they changed the subject and that made them think that perhaps they had something negative to do with what happened back then mm -hmm. and it's very very difficult for this generation today's generation to hear all this but they do want to hear it mm -hmm. and they see that i'm not an angry person so it it it's uh we, we hug afterwards and uh i wish i could be with all of you you'd all get a hug for me too and um <laughs> very important hugs are very important so um but they don't shy away from wanting to hear about it mm -hmm. so it's it's uh it's important mm -hmm. and for, so it, it, it's sad but that's how it is. Thank you. Um, we have some questions about um, how um, do you see connections between anti-Semitism and other kinds of racisms today and the anti-Semitisms and racisms of Nazi Germany? And what kind, you mentioned, of course, tolerance. Are there other strategies you think that college campuses should be pursuing? I think education is very important, mm -hmm. utmost important. Lack of education pertaining to the subject creates major, major problems. And I don't want to go into it because I'm not an a, a economist and I'm not a historian, so we'll just let it go with that. But education is of utmost importance, for sure. And the, uh, the but, different Holocaust museums are oh, also important. There are so many Holocaust museums. Yes. That, uh, it's a tremendous educational tool. And, uh, they're, and also what Oregon State is doing. And you're, a week of, of the, sure you do more here your university you're giving these students and your community the opportunities to learn about the holocaust mm -hmm. all weeks worth which is tremendous mm -hmm. so don't i'm sure you're not minimizing that 
but just I just hope that that uh, the students and the community is is um, taking advantage of all that you have to offer. Mm -hmm. and I and Natalia and I certainly appreciate all of that and uh, keep it going. Keep it going, please. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know if you know, but the Oregon um, state of Oregon passed a Senate bill that manda that mandates now Holocaust and uh, comparative digital ed education in K through twelve classrooms. And for those of you in the audience, we'll be talking about that later on this week as well. How to teach the Holocaust. The sad thing is, though, that uh, it's up to the teacher as to how much yes. they to cover. Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, and I, yeah, I'm really they, hoping they have the teachers have their own uh, mentality or their own mindset and their own agenda sometimes. And that can become mm, okay. Yeah. yeah, I think that we have to have education at all levels, right? That's including yeah. among our, our teacher but, development. But education is, is very important. And and the fact that they hear it firsthand. So uh, we would just keep running as now it's virtual running as fast as we can, as long as we're able to pass the story on, but above all, the lessons learned. That's yeah. what's important. Yeah. Sure. Um, you talked a little bit about playing um, with your your pet shadows and this kind of thing as a coping mechanism, and it's also just a kind of child's play, it sounds like. Did you know other children in the camps as well? Oh, I knew many, many children at the mm -hmm. camp. As I had mentioned earlier, many did not survive. Right. But my friend Susie and I were very fast, dear friends with one another. And I never shared my games with them. I just mm -hmm. didn't. I might have thought they thought me as being foolish or like, what do you mean? What is, what is this? Mm -hmm. but, so I kept it. And I'm sorry because I, they might have benefited from these games as well. Or maybe they would have thought of other games that I could have benefited by. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, it, it, uh, it was child's play, but it worked for me, for sure. What about you and your brother? Um, you, you mentioned how he coped later on in life. Uh, had you been close before? Yes. Yeah, very, very close with one another. Spoke every week. And, uh, and even during those miserable years, he was a dear, 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 dear protective friend of mine, in addition to being a brother. Yes, as best he could. Oh, very good. Um, were there any opportunities while you were interned um, to practice uh, any religious practices at all? Were you were people observant? Well, uh, some more and some less. Some of them were very kept praying and hoping that the man upstairs would uh, uh, find a way for us to be saved. And 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 uh, and then there were those who were angry. Okay. How could you allow this to happen? But you heard me say, men did this to one another. I have to believe that. Otherwise, you know, it, it becomes too difficult to hold on to the religious belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have so many people. Um, what, what kinds of stories do you often tell your grandchildren? Very little yet. Oh, no, grandchildren, on the grandchildren, our parents themselves. And uh, well, we were taking children to Germany, Ariel. That's right, no, that's right. For the, for the 50th um anniversary, the, our first trip to Germany in 1995, we invited uh, all, all our three children to join us, and two of them were able, one was unable to come. And uh, but he did come later, and and grandchildren, it's only Ariel who came, oh, right? No, then Gabi came. Oh, then Gabi, our we have a um. Our children and grandchildren living in Israel, and our grandson from Israel came along with uh, our granddaughter from New York. And with the with the son who couldn't make it the first time, David. What's that? David. Oh yeah, yeah, but I did say that David made it. Okay, so all of our children uh, were in Israel, and they saw where all of this happened, and we visited my father's grave. And anyway, it's. You might uh, just mention about Troy, but. What about toilets? Yeah, we visited a woman's home. We were in. Oh, no, no, never mind. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, languages. I speak a clean bit of Holland. I speak a little bit of Dutch. I name it a very good speak some Hebrew. I speak a very good Deutsch. I speak yeah. an excellent yeah. German. And I do speak some English. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just some, I think, yes. Uh, 
Äh, Sie sprechen auch Deutsch, ja? Auch Deutsch, ja, ich unterrichte auch Deutsch, ja. Ja, sehr gut, ja. Um, so, um, a couple of people here thanking you that they were able to bring their children and some places, grandchildren as well, to this talk. Um, and I want to really, really um, also again, thank you for uh, being part of our community um, here um, this evening, even virtually. You know, I, we, it, you mentioned our students a lot, but this is a big community outreach piece for us as well. And it's really, we're quite honored to have so many people who are here, obviously, from our community um, with their children and their grandchildren. It's so wonderful. Right. I just, I, can I get one more question and then I'll wind down? I think that's a great idea. Um, so uh, I think one of the other main topics here is, um, you know, you're, you, do you, do you ever slow down? You seem like you're just keep going. No, oh, allow that. No, we won't do that. Okay. As long as we're able, we'll just keep on running. At this moment, it'll be virtual. And we've done Oh my goodness, how many schools, how many? Oh, well, we made over 2,000 talks. 2,000, over 2,000. Anyway, um, it, it's, it, we typically used to, when we traveled, we typically left on the Sunday, we turned always on the Thursday, so we'd be home for our Sabbath. And sometimes, very often, two trips a month. <laughs> there were already three a month. And, uh, and when we're on these trips, there are six, seven, or eight presentations for each four days or so that we're there, two a day. Okay. No, not two a day, maybe. So Although the Wednesday, I have three, because it's Holocaust Remembrance Day. Yeah, yes. I, I again, want to thank you so, so much um, for having given me this opportunity, the university, and and, and Mrs. Blessing for, Professor Blessing for giving uh, of monitoring this, and um, and of course uh, our wonderful tech person and Ms. Professor Kupperman, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so September much. September eleventh, two thousand and one. None of us, none of us will ever be allowed to forget that date as long as we live. At that time, Nathaniel and I were in Florida visiting children and grandchildren, and also presenting in schools. And because our planes were grounded, we chose to drive home. And as we approached New York and crossed the Verrazano Bridge, amidst the smoking ruins of the Twin Towers, we could see the Statue of Liberty holding high the torch of freedom. It is that flame of freedom that the terrorists sought to destroy, but could not and never will, because we will take good care of our freedom. We will safeguard our freedom. We will not and must not take our freedom for granted. Let us all, each and every one of us, redouble our efforts to be kind and good towards one another. And with that, I wish each and every one of you a healthy, happy, productive future in a world of love and peace. Thank you.